is a transformational figure. The current Prime Minister, Ahil Mariam Salim, once described him as a visionary leader, as an intellectual and a technocrat who has been caught working not only for the renaissance of Ethiopia, but also for the renaissance of all of Africa, end of quote. Former U.S. President Bill Clinton described him as a renaissance leader in, his, in her tribute to the Nawi. After his days, Susan Rice, the then National Security Advisor to the Obama administration, described him as uncommonly wise. She said he wasn't just brilliant, he wasn't just a relentless negotiator and a formidable debater, he was uncommonly wise, she said, someone that is able to see the big picture and the long game. For his detractors and his opponents, however, the now is anything but a negotiator and a debater. He is seen as a helpless tyrant and dictatorial that is responsible for systematically dismantling the very conditions that make negotiation and debate possible. He totalizes the Ethiopian political sphere, excluded millions from having a say in things that directly affect their life and the life of their nation, and established himself as the untouchable sovereign in whose person resides the collective will of the Ethiopian people, himself another king. Still for others, Mendes was a complex figure, someone that embodies the traits of a brutal dictator and a political economic genius, both unified in one. So who was Mendes Dinawi and what is his legacy? To discuss this further, I'm joined by two people who have an in-depth knowledge of Dinawi the man and his practice. In Oslo, we have Mr. Lenjo Letta. Lenjo is himself a dominant figure in Ethiopian politics. He was, founder, he was the founding member and deputy secretary general of the Ormo Liberation Front. He was also the leading negotiator for the OLF before the transition and one of the key players who took part in, the, in conceptualizing uh, the post dark political transition in Ethiopia. Lenjo is also author of three books, including most recently, Of the Whole of Africa as a Common Homeland. In Boston, we have Professor Alex Duval. Uh, Alex Duval is Executive Director of the World and Peace Foundation and a research professor at the Flater School. He is considered one of the foremost experts on Sudan and the Horn of Africa. Uh, his scholarship and practice uh, has probed humanitarian crisis and response to human rights, issues around HIV and AIDS, governance in Africa, conflict and peace building. Uh, Professor uh, Diwal is also author of seven different books, including most recently of the real politics of the whole of Africa, many war and the business of power. And this book is dedicated to Malade Nawi and contains a chapter uh, on Ethiopia where he talks about the Ethiopian state and the role that now he played uh, in transforming or reconfiguring uh, that state. Gentlemen, welcome to Conversations and Ideas. It's great to join you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, I want to I wanna take you back in time uh, a little bit. Um, Mr. Lejo, you have worked with um, with Malaysia now, uh, you know him as, as an individual and also as a political player. Uh, what kind of man was Malaysia now as, as an individual? We'll get to the politics and the economics and, 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 and the more complex legacy, but what, what kind of person was he as an individual? Well, uh, of all the TPLF leaders, uh, the person that I met uh, very late uh, is Mala Zainawi. Uh, so my interaction with him was from summer 1990 until 1993 94 when we separated course. Mala's the person is a voracious reader uh, who can absorb information um, readily extensively. He enjoys debating, but hates losing. Uh, he was a thinker, basically. Uh, he was a visionary also, in short. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Professor Alex, um, in this book that I um, just mentioned, The Real Politics of the Horn of Africa, you describe the Nawi as the ablest political intellectuals of his generation. You also call him one of the region's most important political thinkers. Uh, you state that you have known him for nearly 25 years. 
Um, you also tell us about specific moments when you met him for the first time in this book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more uh, about this encounter with him for the first time and, and the kind of person that he was at, at a personal level? My first meeting with, with Mellis, whom I was introduced to as Comrade Mellis, was in, in as, the, as the sun was setting at the Sudanese border in 1988. And I was crossing the border to go to Tigray to do um, some work on an agricultural rehabilitation program in areas of Tigray controlled by TPLF. Though, of course, the war against the Derg was still, still on at its height at that stage. And I met Comrade Mellis um, as I clambered on board a captured uh, Soviet-built uh, truck that had been taken from from the from the Dirk, and we travelled um, overnight through the next day, where we camped under the trees to shelter from the the aerial bombardment, and then over the next night, and it was like being in a travelling seminar. There was him. There were several other leaders of of, of, of TPLF, myself, and, and one other. And the entire time we were discussing. Uh, issues of political economy, of, of, of the role of the peasants, of what was happening in the world, of perestroika and things like that. And Mellis came across as somebody who was a very, very able intellectual, a debater, someone who was a Marxist-Leninist through and through in the way that he analyzed problems, um, who, who, when he spoke, he spoke as though his whole paragraph, his whole argument was formed in his head before he began to speak. And, and, and so he was an extremely able uh, interlocutor. Um, and, and I had some great discussions with him. I agreed on some things, disagreed on others. I learned a lot. Um, I found it very hard to influence his thinking. He was already, he, he, he'd already figured out most of the issues um, that, uh, that, we, that we were debating, including the ones on which I quite profoundly disagreed with him. But it was the beginning of, of, of an intellectual friendship that lasted and, and, and until the time of his death and, and, and one that I valued. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Lejo, you have taken part in some of the early negotiations during the transition. Uh, uh, you also played a part in, uh, uh, in the transitional government and also the discussion prior to the transitional, uh, transitional government. And as we know, uh, the kind of policy or conceptual architecture for the current Ethiopian states was basically laid down in that, in that document, which is the transitional uh, charter. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what was Mendes' role in, in designing that document? To what extent is the outcome, that is the transitional document, uh, influenced by him? Or were there other actors who contributed uh, to, that, uh, to that outcome? Well, uh, the three organizations, OLF, TPLF, EPLF, where the schedule to bring in their leaders together was made in London at the end of the so-called London Conference. It was suggested by uh, today's president of Eritrea, Isaiah Safawarki. Uh, so when we got together finally in a town called San Afe, uh, Isaiah had small notes concerning Eritrea. His views were very simple. It is how to systematically disengage from Ethiopia. He presented that and then turned to Mellas and asked him uh, what about for Ethiopia. There was a document that <clears throat> the TPLF had published on the transitional arrangement prior to the meeting, so it was a public information, and he started reciting those. Uh, at this stage, uh, President Isaias turned to me and asked me what our views would be, and I had rough notes on full scrap paper for the outline of the document that later on became the charter. Our leader, President Isaias, immediately said, let's work on that. Mm -hmm. So from then on, the, the document that I presented became the basis for discussion. That discussion culminated 
in drafting the the channel charter. In talking to Mellas, he writing something on a piece of paper. Uh, a note of interpretation has been given to that uh, photograph. It was actually uh, a moment when I was telling him that the territories of the various nations should be clearly delineated, this to be added to the charter. Mm -hmm. So basically, the outline for the charter was uh, the uh, brainchild of the oil left. All right, thanks. Um, Professor Duval, you, as I said earlier, uh, you know Malas very well. You you seem to know his thinking both politically and also economically. Uh, to what extent do you think Malas influences the current uh, architecture in Ethiopia, the economic, political, constitutional design of the Ethiopian state? I think he, he had a profound influence. I mean, I think he Malas was a superb, a uh, strategic thinker and and also an excellent tactician so that he quite often was able to get his way politically through the various institutions of, of the state, but also the party, the EPIDF, etc., through his grasp of, of, of tactical issues, so he could outmaneuver his, his opponents. And in order to do that, he was often disguised what he was doing. So, he, 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 so sometimes you would, you would see him advancing a, a position which wasn't necessarily the position that he really believed in. And what, and what you see in the structure of EPRDF, TPLF, and the MLLT, the Marxist-Leninist League of Tigray, is that, yes, he, he himself was a Marxist-Leninist, but he stopped talking about the MLLT. And one of the issues I find most fascinating, and it's an issue on which, for me, is unresolved, is his Mellis' own position on the issue of nations and nationalities. And, and I should say the reason why I dedicated my book to the memory of Malus is over the years, 25 years that I knew him, we had a series of conversations. And he promised that um, when he stepped down from office, and he promised he was going to do that, he would write a book about the democratic developmental state and, and his vision for Ethiopia. And I had a critique of that book. And, and I was going to, to, to also write my critique. And because he passed away before he was able to do that, what I did was I published my, my book, The Real Politics, which includes a, a, an analysis and, and, and a critique of, of, an incomplete critique of his view. And I say this is an incomplete task, because what I really wanted to do was to allow, hear him properly unfold his views, which he never did when he was in office. He said he would only really be able to do that after he'd retired from office. Then we would really knew, know what he, what he believed and what he argued, and then I would be able to do the same. So it is, as it were, a project that was unfinished and can never be finished. But the point that I want to, to focus on here is I never got clarity on what exactly he meant by nation and national. Because I asked him about the, the federal constitution and, and the fact that it had, you know, the, it gave rights, uh, rights including self-determination to, to, to different national groups within Ethiopia. And I said, where does this come from? He said, well, it comes from the Marxist-Leninist theory of nations and nationalities. And of course, that the the the, fame, the original text on that was written by Joseph Stalin in 1913, but never fully adopted by by Lenin. Lenin was always a little bit ambivalent about this. And if you read the and and and, and he said, and we adopted it because we had no political alternative at the time. He said it came from the OLF. We needed the OLF. <laughs> of course, later on he later on they said they didn't need the OLF, but at the time they needed OLF. They would have not been able to, to consolidate the transition in 1991 without Hoyle being there. There's no, no question about that. And so um, then the question arises, well, you have this definition in Stalin, Stalin's definition, which talks about language and territory and shared culture. But then, he, then Stalin goes on to a second sentence, which is never quoted, which is, he says, nations are a product of history, and like all products of history, they rise and fall. Now, this means that the nations as they exist at a particular time are a product of a particular history. So if you take that theory seriously, history moves on. A lot happens in the intervening period. Ethiopia is being transformed. Whether you like it or not, it is changing. 
So what does that mean for the nations and nationalities and peoples of, of, of Ethiopia? I never got an answer to that question. I was promised an answer. It wasn't that he, he refused to give one. It was that we ran out of time because he passed away. So this, for me, is one of the, the unanswered questions about whether the current constitutional order in the mind of Melus was work in progress or it was something fixed. Hello, Awal, have we lost you? He's gone. Aha. Uh -huh. Frozen. Ah. He's coming back. Inshallah. Uh. You speak Arabic, right? I speak I speak enough to understand Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean maybe to just continue the conversation he, he was candid that we need that he or EPRDF needed our life at that point and that much of this agenda was 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 taken from our life. his tactical calculation appears to have changed or the tactical no maybe not him but the EPRDF leadership as a whole you see actually in one way uh, the path that they were charting in the 1980s was clear. Mm. Uh, a Marxist-Leninist leadership for Ethiopia, a vanguard party. Mm. Then you can uh, devolve power to the various regions, however you define them, but maintain the central control exactly like the CPSU. Yes. Unfortunately, Toward this, just as he was coming to power, the CPSU lost power. And you couldn't openly say, okay, we are Marxist Leninist. Yeah. But the model, it's interesting that the model you describe is absolutely correct because the problem that EPRDF has now, our party, and all the, the everything that has been adopted at regional level by that client part they've just taken the same there's no diversity in in in, in how the, the 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 constituent federal states run themselves and this of course is a complete antithesis of, of really what federal federalism and the right to set, including the right to self-determination ought to be and it is on this point i think that the, the, the country is is, is is in danger of of tearing itself apart. Yeah, that is a controversy that resulted not from their choice, but from how the world politics evolved exactly at the moment they were coming to power. Mm -hmm. It was very clear they never wanted the oil left permanently. They needed us to... Uh, frustrate or to cow the Amhara elite, yeah. this big stick sitting with them, and once they discovered that the Amharas were not putting up much uh, resistance, we became unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure what, whether we have lost our, but maybe we just... <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I don't understand this technology anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we have, I mean, now we have this phenomenon that you have. You know, this is so
Maybe we are being sabotaged from somewhere. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is the mechanism for suppressing free exchange of, 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 of views on the on the airways. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what is this? Well, I've heard this before. Maybe a lift. This is this is this is this is this Have you ever seen this in Alex, let us, you and I continue talking. <laughs> Let's, yeah, let, it, let us discuss and we will. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And sadly, what I see at the moment is that, I mean, the, 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 the most unfortunate thing I think about the legacy of it's required somebody of his personal capabilities 